The meeting of the Joint Legislative Task Force and Education Finance Reform will come to order at 9.38. We're late. Again. It's only our second meeting. This cannot continue. Ladies and gentlemen, we have only one item on the agenda today. So here's how we're going to go forward. The, as I, I mentioned at our last meeting, which was our first meeting, this is a heavy lift. It's a complex issue. Education policy, education finance is very complex. In order for us to have a grasp of really the scope and extent of what's in front of us, we need to learn a lot more about how we got here, what other states are doing, what our options are, etc. And we're fortunate enough today to have with us uh, Michael Griffin, who is a school finance strategist with the Education Commission of the States. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I'm just trying to set the stage for, for this meeting in that this is going to be somewhat of a conversational presentation as questions arise in your mind, you hear something, you want some clarity. My experience is that if you have a question, three other people have the same question. They just don't know how or are not necessarily willing to ask it, except for Representative Blackwell, who's willing to ask any question at any time. <laughs> and, and Senator Tillman's ready to give him an answer to any question at any time. You only ask if you already know the answer. So before I begin, uh, I want to ensure that we introduce our uh, the folks that are helping us bring this to fruition today. Our Sergeant at Arms from the House, Reggie Sills, Marvin Lee, Thomas Terry, there back in the corner, and from the Senate, Hal Roach and Billy Fritcher. Did I pronounce that right? Wow, good for me. Uh, with a name like Horn, it even gets mispronounced sometimes. Well, it certainly gets misspelled. Uh, and now before we... Oh, one other thing. We have a number of members. You see them. They're not here, but that doesn't mean they're not listening in. I know of at least two members that are listening in, and I've asked one of them if they have a question, comment, please text, so I may be uh, speaking on behalf of, and I will advise if I am another member that's that's texted me a question or a comment and now before I go any further Senator Lee opening comments just glad to be here good to see y'all <laughs> be sure to fill out your forms and get them to the sergeant at arms we're paid little enough as it is let me go back now to our program for the day. Mike Griffin has worked in the field of school finance policy for the past 19 years with the Education Commission of the States, the consulting firm of Ogden, Blick and Myers, and Michigan State Senate. His research has focused on the condition of state budgets, the adequacy and equity of state finance formulas, and promising practices in funding programs for high-need students. Mike is an expert resource to national news media and has been quoted more than 300 times by such outlets. I wonder how many of those quotes have been correct. Well, that's another issue. Such outlets as CNN, Education Week, NBC Nightly News, National Public Radio, and the New York Times. Mike holds a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University, where I happen to have a granddaughter doing graduate work right now, as a matter of fact. A master's degree in public administration from the Ohio State University, and a master's degree in education management from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. When he is not focused on the issue of school finance, Mike can be found rooting for his Michigan State Spartans. Go green. My goodness. <laughs> with that again I remind you please as we go we'll take questions unless that process gets out of hand but this is to be intended to be 
part of that learning process for so that as we go forward we can give consideration to options what other states are doing etc thank you mr griffin for joining us today the floor is yours Well, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm with the Education Commission of the State. Some of you may know of us, some of you may not. We are a national organization representing state policymakers. We have, as our members, 49 states, three territories in the District of Columbia. The only non-member state is the state of Washington. So you are a member of ECS, and you have been for a long time. So I, we really appreciate that. We appreciate the fact that you pay your dues, and that allows for people like me to come out to your state and present. Um, also to let you know, you're going to hear me talk a lot about your system, about maybe changes you can make, about how to transition from sort of the school funding system you have today to maybe a different one. Just know that at ECS, we don't have a dog in the fight. We're here to help you. I was asked to talk about your current system, maybe some possible changes you could make, and then how could you get to that point. So I've sort of broken my speech up into three sections. In the first part, we'll talk about where you're at, some of the issues with your current formula. Maybe in the second part, we'll talk about where you could go and some of the advantages to some other formulas. And finally, the, the third part is how can we get there? How as a state can you get there? Uh, everything I'm going to be talking about today you can find on our website at ecs.org, and then I'll have my contact information at the end. I would welcome questions, as, as the chair said, during this, while I'm speaking, while I'm presenting, but also if you think of something tomorrow, the next day, later, please feel free to email me or, or give me a call. I'm always happy to, to talk about school funding. Um, and to let you know what I do is I work on nothing but school funding. Um, at one point or another, I've read all 50 state school finance formulas which is a really sad statement about my life, <laughs> and the worst pickup line you can use at a bar. Um, so, so what I want to talk today is, you know, in this sort of order. First off, let's talk about what a high-quality funding formula is, um, how, and then talk about how you currently fund schools and how that compares to what we sort of see as a high-quality system, what you might want to change, um, how other states are currently funding, their systems, and what would it tra take to transition to a new system? So what we look at when we think of a high-quality system, we would look at, is it adequate? And so when we say adequate, we mean, is it adequate to meet your state standards for all of your students? Uh, a lot of times I get asked, what is the adequate dollar amount? And it really depends on what your state standards are and what your goals are, and it changes from state to state. It also changes based on your cost of doing business. In some places it's higher, some places it's lower. So when you take a look at spending per pupil, you see it's all over the sort of the range in this country, going as low as about 7,500 per kid and as high as about 17,000 per kid. Um, some of that can be explained by regional cost adjustment. The highest spenders tend to be in the New England area and Alaska. Uh, Wyoming is the exception to that. And then the lower spenders tend to be in the West where it's a little cheaper to, to educate students. Then we want to look at, is the system equitable? And we don't mean perfect equity. Are you spending the exact same amount per kid in every school district? No one does that. But are you relatively, relatively equitable? Are you spending based on uh, some sort of balance between your highest and lowest or your highest and lowest compared to the middle? Um, is your funding formula flexible? What, and we'll talk a lot about this with your formula, but the idea is the state, if things work best when the state makes the decision, allocates the funds down, and how to spend those dollars are left to the school districts. Um, that gives them greater flexibility to deal with a lot of new needs and new programs that are out there nowadays in education. Um, and that gets into the, is it adaptable? Is your system able to change as we're changing the way we educate kids nowadays? Um, and again, we'll talk about that with your own system. I'd like to interrupt you. Well, I don't need to interrupt you. Representative Blackwell will do it for me. I'm happy for you to go first. You may have begun to handle what I was going to comment on. Thank you, Representative Blackwell. Mr. Green, the, uh, 
the issue of per pupil expenditures, PPE as it's often referred to, and you referred to it under your adequacy portion. Here in North Carolina, we are one of and arguably the fastest growing state in the nation, certainly one of the fastest growing states in the nation. Therefore, we have a lot of, a lot of kids coming in. We need a lot of teachers to Teachers don't generally start at the top or even in the middle of the pay scale. New teachers, of course, start at the bottom of the pay scale. So if you have increasing number of teachers and an increasing, or excuse me, increasing number of students and an increasing number of teachers at the lower end of the pay scale, your PPE per pupil expenditure is going to be lower, which does not necessarily at all mean that their quality of their education or that you're not meeting the needs of the student. As the teaching core matures, the per pupil expenditure, same number of students even, same number of teachers, the PPE will go up. So I have a hard time personally using PPE as a benchmark of much of anything, quite frankly. Uh, involved in PPE are, are uh, the fixed costs of running your school. Well, if a school is built to hold a thousand students and holds 700, your PPE is X. Just do the math. If your student population happens to go up to 800 or a thousand, your fixed costs are the same. Your PPE is going down, but nothing's really changed with regard to quality, et cetera. So I'd like you to address that PPE issue, if you would, please. And, and that kind of gets to the point I was talking earlier of why we don't have a universal number of per pupil expenditure that we say this is where everyone should be at if they okay. want to be adequate. It's a lot's going to vary based on what's happening in your state at the time. Um, what your student demographics look like. Again, when you look at per pupil numbers in some states they have a much higher at risk, so low income group of students. Other states have a much higher English language learner population. And in those places you're probably spending more. So two states that look like they're spending equally, one might need more because they have these higher cost kids. You have variables like you're talking about, younger age population, how is your retirement structure set up? Um, what is your current capacity within schools? I can tell you I'm working in a lot of states talking about the capacity issue in a lot of the states in the center part of the country. Um, access capacity is a huge issue. They're down to 50% or less of capacity in their schools and that produces a higher cost per kid. Um, so you need to take all that into account, uh, but at some point you need to figure out what's the right number for you and then say, are we there? Or are we we there? need you to speak into the oh, mic. I'm sorry. just being told that they're not always picking you up. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, and if you don't mind, I'll turn. And That's fine. <laughs> but but no, so I take anyway, no offense. Uh, those are all the variables that kind of go into are you spending the right amount, but... You need to find, and, and all of that, too, plays into what are your educational expectations in your state, and it varies greatly. I've worked in some states where their goal is to get 40% of their kids to go on to uh, college after graduation for high school. I've worked in other states where their goal is 70%. Very different cost structure, and very different needs of spending in those two areas. Um, in some states, they want to do career and tech training, during the K-12 years. In other states, if you feel uh, career and tech training is best done after K-12, that's going to change their cost structures too. So there are all of these things that come into play, and that does not even bring in the single biggest expense for education, our teacher salaries and benefits. Nationally, about 60% of ed spending goes to teacher salaries and benefits. About 20% of spending goes to other salaries, so that's everyone from the lunch lady up to the superintendent. And then the remaining 20% goes into everything else. That's the national average, but it holds pretty close in every state, and it holds pretty close in most districts around the country. So when we talk about things like teacher salaries, they are by far the largest influencer of what you need to spend in your districts. That's addressed in your formula because your formula allots teaching positions, within this, um, but we'll talk in a little bit when we describe your formula why the issues that sort of arise from that. Is that helpful? Okay. It is. It's, uh, maybe it's, I'm being a little thin-skinned. As, as a policymaker, I hear about PPE all the time. I get beat up over PPE, and I 
uh, for the reasons that I talked about and you talked about, uh, I'm generally resistant to uh, the what I see, think is an inordinate focus on PPE because of all the variables that you mentioned and the and the realities of us doing education. But thank you for that explanation, Representative Blackwell. I'm not sure if I have a question or a comment that I would maybe like some response to. And maybe you can say what we're talking about today doesn't deal with what I'm going to mention, or maybe you're going to give it, deal with it later. But as I think about education, in my mind at least, uh, it's not about – uh, being sure that we spend equal amounts of money on students. It's about being sure that students receive the education that they need to be successful, whatever that means, as an adult citizen and uh, provider for themselves and their families and so forth. And so I'm especially attracted to these two points that would allow districts under a high-quality funding formula to have more flexibility to meet their unique needs, which I interpret to mean the unique needs for their students, uh, and to be adaptable so that the state is not forcing programs and policies on them that prevent them from changing how we deliver services to the students that we're trying to educate. The problem that we run into that is covered by our PED report in part is that when we give flexibility and adaptability to our districts, they don't always spend the money the way some people in Raleigh think they should. My inclination is to go with the flexibility and the adaptability, but at some point, when does the state say to a district, and does what you're going to talk about go into this, okay, we gave you these items. We, we did a high-quality funding formula. We maximized your ability to meet the unique needs of your students and to adapt the delivery systems, but you're not getting it done. So, therefore, we're going to do things differently. We're not going to have flexibility and adaptability to the same extent. Are we going to cover that, or is that a different topic when we get into uh, outcomes for students and whether the formula is being used by these LEAs uh, appropriately? Uh, we're going to cover that. It's sort of at the end of the story, but I can skip to that chapter if you no, want. No, let's, okay. let's stay on track. We Then my presentation would be over in about 15 minutes because that's the sort of the video. Representative Lucas has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question. First of all, let me describe a circumstance, and you probably are already aware that North Carolina is a dependent school system. We fund the entire state school system. There are other states that vary that formula, and they have independent school systems. And how do we rate as compared to other states? in terms of the PPEs and uh, the dependency that we in, use here in North Carolina. Other states may not use that formula. So um, and we use dependent and independent a little differently, so I want to make sure I have the definition, and we, we both have the same one here. When you're talking independent, we, you, you have districts that are dependent on their local communities um, for funding. No, actually we have... Our entire state is dependent upon the General Assembly allocation. We do this per pupil across the entire state. Then there are other LEAs that may subsidize this. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, we allocate this on a per pupil basis throughout the state. Uh, there are other states that have what we call independent school systems. Maybe a city does this themselves or Maybe uh, another unit in the state does this differently. We do it across the entire state. So there are um, the only state that 100% funds education. Uh, I take let me take that back. 
There are a couple of states where the state is completely in charge of education funding. Hawaii is one, but that's a single school district, so that's... Michigan is another. They made a change back in 94, and even though there's local property taxes that are collected, they are sent up to the state. And then the state makes all the decisions about allocation. Um, and the locals are kind of kept out of it. All they know is what they're going to get from the state in any given year. They can do a little something extra for special ed funding and for tech funding, but it's a very small percentage of their, their allocation. Most other states, though, have a mix, one way or the other, of state and local funds. In some of those cases, what they say is they mandate local levies and say you will raise a certain amount. We will then, if you raise that amount, provide you with state funding in addition to that. And then if you choose, you can raise more than that minimum amount, but you've got to raise that. Um, that would be sort of the norm in the majority of states. Some others say, kind of like your system, we're going to provide you money. You can choose if you want to to supplement that with local. Um, usually we have a lot of pretty colored maps. I don't have one of those to show that, but I'll keep that in my head, and I'll, I'll give you something in the next couple of days um, if you'd like to look at that. I have a um, couple of notes uh Representative Corbin has uh, sent a question I'll ask in just a moment. Representative Johnson is also listening in. I know those two at least. I believe that Senator Brown is also listening in. Uh, <laughs> Representative Johnson sends her greetings to everyone. She's one of the co uh, co-chair uh, here with me on several uh, education-related committees. Representative Corbin asks, and I quote, in the end, is it possible to set up a funding plan that asks each of our 100-plus school systems to submit a, a plan, say each January, that each superintendent formulates, where positions are requested based on each school system's needs, not a formula? In other words, get away from one teacher for every 18 kindergartners, for example. The current system is unfavorable for rural and smaller counties. These requests would be reviewed and revisited in September when actual numbers are known. I'm afraid that sounds to me like that question is getting ahead of us, a lot, quite far ahead of us. But uh, I, I can to talk respond. to him very quickly just to, to make sure I answer it, but if, if I don't lay it around to please keep me honest. But there are some states that have set up funding formulas and then have turned around and said to um, districts that have special needs for one way or another. Sometimes they're small school districts. Sometimes they're districts with a high percentage of special ed students. Um, sometimes they're districts that have a very high transportation cost that you can come back and ask for something in addition to the formula. But there is no one that I've ever heard of that has done away with the formula completely and just based it on an ask from districts. Um, they've tried to set up that flexibility and to take things into account by creating an extra pot or a couple extra pots, but the main driver has been the primary formula itself. Okay. Representative Dixon, you had a question, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Griffith, I think we've, we've just experienced in the exchange so far as to why Representative Horn is exactly correct that this is going to be a, 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 a heavy lift because it's so easy uh, uh, to get uh, divergent uh, attempts. I do think I have a basic question. Okay. I think I could make a legitimate argument that the very initial attempts that we're making to equate um, uh, how we're doing relative to what we're spending and State to state comparison, LEA to LEA comparison, is on its face uh, invalid to start with. That uh, these these comparisons are not valid. Is is there anyone who's looked at another starting point other than taking how much we're spending as the initial point of? deciding whether we're doing a good job or not? Yes. Um, some have done it in combination with creating a funding formula. Some have just kind of gone out and done it independent of even thinking of funding is, are our kids hitting the goals that we need them to hit? Um, there's one type of study that's out there that's called the successful school study. So you look at those schools within your state that are hitting your state standards or above, 
your expectations for all your kids, not just general ed, but at risk and special ed and all that. Um, and they try to say, what are they spending? Okay, that should give us an idea maybe where we should spend. Um, there was an attempt, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in Massachusetts, that they came up with an assessment and accountability system first. Then they stopped and they said, we should tie this in somehow to funding. If this is our goals for our kids, we should turn around and connect this to the funding we have. And I know comparing you guys to Massachusetts was not something that you always want to do, but it's a state that's been pretty successful. They made the change in funding. They raised the bar in assessments for students. And since then, they've been the leader in NAEP scores, the national assessment test that's given around the country in all 50 states. Um, they've been the leader not just in overall scores, but for at-risk kids and for English language learners and, ma and math and reading. And so that's a sign of success where they didn't just look at the funding, they looked at the goals and the expectations of their state. Um, Hi. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, uh, partially. Okay. Let's, uh, I may have end up being sorry that I ever suggested that we have a conversational presentation instead of a presentation presentation, but we'll, let's get back on track. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, I know you've talked about, had some other people talk to you about your funding system in your state and talk about it in more details. I just want to do a quick sort of primer to remind you, you have the type of system that we would call a position allocation system. The idea here is that you fund a certain number of positions um, for, per student, and that includes in, in these types of systems almost always teaching <laughs> positions, but then positions like principals, assistant principals, maybe things like nurses and librarians in some states. Um, and it was originally done so policymakers could know what are they buying. You could sit there and say, we are spending this amount right now in our state, and we know we have this many teachers that we're funding and this many superintendents and this many librarians and this many nurses, um, you can track that and you know what you're purchasing. system made an awful lot of sense when you had all of your students attending brick and mortar schools in their neighborhoods because you could track it, you could understand it as you saw certain needs arise, maybe um, social workers, for instance, are needed in school districts, you could add that to the formula. But again, you'd be tracking it and you'd be saying, we know exactly how many social workers are out there. So it's a very top-down decision-making process. Um, it was not really the intention, but it was what ended up with in these types of systems that the funding becomes rigid and districts don't have a lot of decision-making or as much as they would under some other funding formulas. So what happens is if you say, I don't need uh, maybe one of these teaching positions, I need a librarian assistant um, and somebody to work in our lunchroom to, for security reasons, you can't necessarily do that under these types of formulas. Um, so what that means is the state has to constantly go back and adjust different line items within these formulas to take into account rising or lowering cost or changes in education. <coughs> um, and again, talking about it, it makes it, it's a force for them to have to do this um, on a regular basis that you have to take a look at your formulas. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the examples I always use is what if you want to change the way in a school that you educate at-risk students. In a position allocation system, very often you're assigned a teacher or a specific program that you have to use for those kids. But if that program isn't working for your kids, it's very difficult to move the money around um, to take that into account. I know you've created greater flexibility within your system. Well, very often when you create greater flexibility in a position allocation system, you're actually making it more complicated and less transparent in some ways. And you're benefiting those schools that have very clever school business officials, and you're punishing those kids who are in a school district or school that doesn't have someone who understands the formula as well. And the example I always use for something like this is when you have a position allocation funding system, every once in a while you'll make changes to it every year or two. As time goes by, each one of those individual changes made sense, but it'd be like a home over a period of time. 
that you kept making changes to, and then one day you wake up and your home has 12 bedrooms, one bathroom, the kitchen is in the backyard, and there's a toilet in the living room. Each one of those may have made sense, but now you have a structure that does not make sense overall. And you're not the only ones who've come to this. All of the states that have had a position allocation system have kind of gone through the same process. Um, when these systems were originally developed in the 60s and 70s, uh, they, there were a lot of issues in education that do not exist, that did not exist then and exist now. So we have things like charter schools, competency-based education, which is this idea of you don't need to go maybe 12 years to school. You can finish up earlier. Some states actually provide a bonus payment to districts that get kids to graduate early. It's difficult to do that in a position allocation system. You have programs like dual and concurrent enrollment where the kids can get college credit while they're going to school. Non-traditional career and tech programs, that's where a student might go work in a office or in a factory during the school day. It's very difficult to take that into account in your current system. Um, open enrollment programs where a kid might spend part of their day in one school and the other part of their day in another. And then student mobility during the school year You've locked schools into a set number of teaching positions. If kids move about during the school year, which we know they do, especially in farming areas, that can put a great stress on your funding formula. So looking at those first four ideas that we talked about, um, adequate, equitable, flexible, and adaptable, looking at the North Carolina system, is it adequate? Well, we've kind of had this discussion. It's very tough to say. Um, you know, there's no dollar amount I can put on for you. Um, that's all going to depend on do you feel it's adequate for your state. Uh, is it equitable? Quality Counts gave you a B plus on a couple of the measures that they use, so that means you're relatively equitable. Uh, the thing I would warn is there are about eight different measures that are used for equity. Um, quality Counts used two of them. Uh, on different ways it's measured, you'll show up in different ways. So sometimes they'll talk about equity as the bottom compared to the top districts. Um, in other cases, they'll talk the bottom compared to the middle or the top and bottom compared to the middle, or they'll weight it based on your student needs. So it's not just are you spending the same in each district, but are you taking into account the higher cost for certain student groups like special education? Um, is it flexible? Well, the current system has limited flexibility. I think you all have heard people talk about that in your system. And is it adaptable? No. The current position allocation system is not something that's adaptable to, to new sort of funding and new ideas that come into education. Sort of another break, if you'd like to. Just hold on for a second. Any okay. questions, comments? Representative Lambeth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just curious, if you went back 10 years ago, where would you have seen the typical formula more in line with what we were doing 10 years ago? Any people have moved away from it or not? That's a great question. And I have a map. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, we, would, we would have seen, and I, why don't I just kind of skip to this, we would have seen more states, a couple more states that had your type of system. Um, we would have seen more states in the yellow, which are these kind of other systems that states had come up with. Some looked like your system kind of partially, and some had other ways of doing it. What we've seen over time is a big movement towards the foundation or base formula, um, and we'll talk about that in a, in a second. I'll say part of that was slowed up, though, by the recession. Whenever you have a really bad economic time, um, states tend to make changes, tend not to make changes in their funding formula. The most of the states in green right now I am working with to help change their formula. Um, they're kind of like you, and, and again, I'll kind of come back and talk about this. But the trend really has been to move to this foundation formula um, and away from the current one. Being no further questions or comments, we'll move on to section two. So I thought it would be sort of Interesting if you saw the generations of school funding over the years. Originally, school funding was not an issue that states were involved in. There are some school districts in this country that are older than the United States. School funding here was a local issue. Um, what we started to see, you know, in the late 19th century, is states started to come in and fund schools, but they did it on a flat payment type of basis, that they said, 
you tell us how many kids you have, we'll give you a dollar amount per kid. It wasn't any more sophisticated than that. Starting in around the 1920s, you saw states become more involved in, in state funding. And what they said is a couple of things simultaneously. First off, we recognize the need for states to become more involved. There are some studies and research that have been done that showed that there was a huge difference in education availability in this country. Um, then they said, we'll provide additional money and we'll base it on your relative wealth. Poor districts will get more from the state. Wealthier districts will get less. Um, but part of the deal that was done when states started stepping in to fund schools is they started consolidating school districts. In the 1920s, there were about 150,000 school districts in this country. Now we have 15,000. So nine out of 10 districts have disappeared since the, the 1920s. Um, so as, and this is a reoccurring theme I'll talk about, as states have stepped up with more and more funding over the years, they've stepped up their control and it's moved from local control to state control in many states. Um, the third generation has started in the 50s and 60s, and this is this idea of it's not just relative wealth, but it's student need we're going to start taking a look at. We're going to look at how many students do you have that are low income? Do you have special education students? Do you have at-risk students? Um, and we're, and we're going to take a look at that and wealth at the same time and try to distribute our funding that way. Your system falls into that third <coughs> generation um, that was sort of derived in the 60s and 70s to address these issues. Um, and again, what happened in states is, is they were asked to step up and provide more money to low-income kids and to these school districts. They started upping their control. And one of the ways of, of controlling the system is having a position allocation funding system to do that. The next generation, and this is sort of the movement we've seen from maybe the 70s to today, is a slow movement to create, make sure you provide funding based on wealth, based on districts' needs for their students, but also provide them with some flexibility and provide them with greater decision-making at the district or school level on how those funds are expended. The vast majority of states now are in that fourth generation. What we would say a fifth generation system is, is then that money that you say, if we're giving a student who's at risk an extra $1,500, we want to be shown that that $1,500 is being spent on Billy Smith or Julie Jones, that student. We now have the data systems in place in school districts that we can start tracking those kind of things. So that's where you start to see this movement with ESSA in, in, in some states to look at what are the expenditures in each school, not just at the school district, and are the kids that we've targeted this extra money for, are they getting that extra money? Um, states are slowly getting to that fifth generation idea of making sure that the money is targeted and spent on the kids that it's supposed to go to. Um, so this is the nice color-coded map of states and their funding formulas. I'll talk very quickly about the states in yellow just so you have some idea and then we'll talk about what a foundation program is. Um, all the states in yellow are the ones that have their own unique state funding system. Again, if you would have looked at this 10 or 20 years ago, there would have been many more states in yellow. I'll just go west to east. Wyoming has a funding system that was created by the courts that mandated that every student have the courses offered to them in high school to allow them to enter into the University of Wyoming upon graduation. Um, and it didn't matter on the size of the district. It didn't matter on their wealth. The state had to provide them with the funds to be able to do that. So they constructed what it would look like in high school, then what would the cost be, um, and then they constructed a junior high that would feed into the high school and an elementary system that would feed into the junior high. They costed it all out, and then they came up with this system. Right now, before this was passed, before the court rulings in Wyoming, Wyoming was kind of middle of the road on spending, around 25th. Um, now they are in the top five. When you adjust for regional costs, they are number one. They had goals, and this kind of gets to the education goals. Their goals weren't student outcomes. Their goals were, do, does every school have a physics teacher? Does every school have four years of quality math? Does every school have four years of quality English? Um, at no point really did the courts talk about student outcomes during all of that. 
Um, Kansas is in yellow there. They kind of bounce back and forth between yellow and blue because of their own court ruling. Um, they originally had adopted a foundation formula several years ago uh, because a uh, court ruling forced them to put additional money into the system. They backed off on that formula about three years ago. Just fairly recently, they adopted a new formula to meet the court mandate, um, and they are probably should be more in the blue right now. But the system they had for a short period of time simply was every school district got what you got the previous year plus an inflation amount. So it didn't matter on your student count, didn't matter on your change in needs. If you got a certain amount last year and the total education budget went up by 2%, you got 2% extra. Um, shrinking districts like that type of system, growing districts do not. Uh, Wisconsin, and I get this question <coughs> often, every state I'm in, people feel their funding formula is the most complicated. Um, the winner for that is actually Wisconsin or Delaware. They have the most complicated system. Wisconsin actually has three different funding formulas that all work together and sort of separately at the same time. Um, if you ever want me to fully explain it, I can do it, but it's very baffling. <coughs> It works for them. They seem to like it, but it's not one I would say you want to emulate. Again, Michigan has the system where the state is completely taking control of the funding system, and they dictate to districts what they're going to get. They collect <coughs> property taxes, and it's all sent up to the state level. They combine that with state sales and income tax and tobacco tax, and then they redistribute money down to school districts. Your redistribu you redistributed amount per student is based on what you were spending in 1994 and adjusted for inflation. Um, Pennsylvania has a system that, uh, similar to Kansas, where it's you get what you, get in the pre you got in the previous year, plus or minus an inflation amount, um, while they're slowly trying to phase in a new funding formula. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. Massachusetts, we talked about, has a system that combines the assessment and accountability system that they had created with a funding formula. Pretty complex system. The idea is that they have line items in there that talk about in a quality education system, we found that you need so much per kid in professional development. So they put that amount in for each kid. They put amounts in for things like um, substitute teachers, uh, teacher salaries, teacher benefits. But unlike <coughs> your system, you don't have to spend that money. This is how they get to the dollar amount. And then they say to districts, it's up to you to spend how you want to. But if you aren't meeting state standards, we're going to ask you why you aren't spending the <coughs> amounts that we originally had in the formula. So if we said you should be spending $50 per kid on teacher professional development and you're not spending that and your, your students aren't succeeding where they should be, we're going to talk to you about that. Um, the Vermont system is the dream system if you're running a school district. Uh, to let you know, Vermont's average school district size is less than 300 kids. The budget is passed in a town hall meeting where people literally raise their hand. And you in the town hall can vote to increase the budget that the district has provided. So if you feel you want more money for a swim team, you as a citizen can go in and put that in, in your budget. And as long as the other citizens vote for it, it will be accepted. Uh, they can do this because they raise a, a very large percentage of their funding on non-homestead property, which are vacation homes that people from New York and Boston own. So if you've got a bunch of outsiders who are paying for something, you can have a system there that is about $17,000 per kid. Um, now let's talk, let's talk about the foundation formula, base formula amount that the vast majority of states have. So you start with a base or foundation formula Amount and technically, I'm going to ask you to, I'm ask you to hold one second, Representative Blackwell. You had indicated a question was it based on what he just said, or do you can you hold that? Uh, it's based on what he said, but I can wait if you want me to. Why don't we let him finish this section? You ask pretty complex questions, or rather, I should say comprehensive questions. You're in charge. Thank you. Sir. So the you start with the base or foundation amount. Theoretically, this amount should be, in a foundation formula, the amount that you need to get a general ed kid to state standards. I will tell you there are only probably three states that actually have their base or foundation amount based on that. The other 32 or so states have a number that the legislature could afford in that given year as their base number. So, you know, that, that really knocks out sort of the logic behind a lot of this is if your base number is not based on something, 
then you know it, it, you're sort of manipulating the whole system. The next thing you do is you do a student count, and when we say weights, that means if you feel that there's additional needs for certain kids, like English language learners, uh, special ed students, at risk or poverty students, you provide them with an additional weight. So a special ed student might count as one and a half students. Uh, English language learner might count as one and a quarter. And then you sort of multiply all those student counts by the foundation amount, and that gets you to a total funding amount, and this gets to your question, Representative Lucas, that in most states they take that total funding amount that you get and they split it between state and local. And they say, okay, this is the amount you're entitled to. Let's say it's $20 million. We're going to say the state will cover half of that, and the local you're going to be responsible for the other $10 million. In some cases, they mandate that you spend that $10 million, that you, you provide your share. In other cases, they say you can provide $10 million. It's up to you. But we're going to provide our $10 million, and then you can choose or not to provide your $10 million. Um, and then what you do is you add on there are some things in these foundation formulas that you do not take into account, usually, and that's transportation, capital, food services. Um, and these are dealt with outside of the primary funding formula. Uh, most states, and we, we call these uh, categorical programs, these are programs that exist outside of the primary formula. Almost every state has these. They usually have about a half a dozen. We can see in a lot of these states growth in these formulas. So over time, as these formulas are there, these little pockets of money become more and more tempting because then legislators, you can know what that money spent on. So that you'll see there might be a program for summer school. That, that The feeling was that's very important. So we're going to create an extra program outside of the primary funding formula just for summer school or just for after school um, or for, um, you know, athletics or other programs. There's no problem with having these, but as they grow, they create greater confusion for school districts, greater paperwork, and greater control over how they can spend their money. Um, until California changed their system about five years ago, they had 90 different separate pockets of money outside of their primary formula. Each one of these had different paperwork requirements, different requirements on how districts could spend them. They had to spend a tremendous amount of time, effort, and energy just figuring out how they could bring in the state dollars and then how they could spend them. So what we say to states that have these types of formulas, you want, might want to think of shrinking those down. California has dramatically shrunk that down. Uh, New York had about 50 of these programs, and they've got it down to about 15 or so. Um, so this is something that is kind of a natural natural factor of these foundation formulas. So why did so many states move to this? Well, it's relatively easy to establish. Again, you've got a dollar amount per kid you can think about. If you want to provide extra money for different groups of kids, you can do that through a weight by giving them additional weights in their student counts. Um, it's very flexible, and it's easy to adjust to the states and districts' needs. So if suddenly you come up with an idea of, you know, there's dual and concurrent enrollment where kids can get college credit, you simply say, okay, now you can spend your foundation allowance on that. Um, you can choose to do that. Maybe instead of teaching a math course in your school, you can contract with the community college, and you can use your funds for that student for that course instead of a course inside the K-12 school. Um, it provides districts with greater autonomy and decision-making, and, I mean, this is always good, right, and it's bad. Some will make very good decisions. Others will not. That's why some states have, when they have a system like this, they also try to set up systems that are essentially warning systems about districts that aren't spending the money correctly. And in some cases, like in Arkansas, they set up a system that says, we gave you freedom to spend your money, but you're not getting student achievement. We're going to come back and start putting spending mandates on you you've lost your freedom because you're not achieving um, where you're supposed to be at for your kids. And again, you can, you can make these uh, variations pretty quickly on things like class size requirements. You can also include uh, teacher salary schedules. If you feel that's what you want in your state, you can have a foundation formula and a teacher salary schedule. You do not need a system like the one you currently have just to have a teacher salary schedule. Um, you can target funding for certain programs and students by, again, putting weights on it, or if you really feel, then taking it outside the formula and turning it into a categorical program. Um, but, again, as you keep doing that, you'll take away the flexibility in the system, but it is something that you're capable of doing. 
I just wanted to show you this. These are the states that have teacher, uh, statewide teacher salary schedules. Um, you would have what we call sort of a full schedule. It's, you can look at your state schedule and determine that's pretty much what your teachers are being paid. They have a similar system in Washington um, and in Delaware. The states in yellow have uh, teacher, statewide teacher salary schedules that really are the minimum you need to pay. Most districts aren't impacted by these numbers. There's usually a couple of low wealth districts each year that butt up against the minimum, but for the most part, that's not an issue. Uh, there are a couple of states that have these statewide teacher salary schedules in place but have not updated them for, in some case, 50 years or more. So it still exists on the books, but it's not really you know, that much of a movement. Uh, for instance, in Illinois, it's, uh, teachers need to be paid a minimum of $1,500 a year. So I'm going to guess that hasn't been an issue for a while in Illinois, um, but they've left it on the books. And in Ohio, they, they had one, and a pretty intricate one, but they haven't updated it for 20 years. So again, it's there, but the minimum teacher salary schedule on that is about $20,000. So um, it just gives you an idea. You don't need to have a system like yours if you really do want a statewide teacher salary schedule. And I remember this from when I was here presenting about eight or 10 years ago. Then I know that's a major concern for some people because they worry that if you move away from the current type of system you have now, where the state is a, you know, sort of establishing the number of positions and what they get paid, so there's something with more freedom, that greater freedom might result in unintended consequences like lower teacher salaries. At this point, the Representative Blackwell, you had been holding a question. Well, the problem with delay is that I may have a second question now, <laughs> if I can get in. At the beginning, you were talking about characteristics of a high-quality funding formula. You mentioned adequacy, equitability, flexibility, and adaptability. Mm -hmm. Then you went, talked about the five generations of school funding formulas. And my question is, mm -hmm. is there some implication that the fifth generation that's listed is a high-quality funding formula because it seems to me it is lacking at least superficially in your description here in the adaptability and the flexibility if it's simply targeted to the student based on specific characteristics and assuming that it says ensuring that the resources are targeted. I assume that means you got to spend it the way the state tells you. That doesn't sound like the high quality, and I'm wondering Am I misreading something? So, and I could have done a better job of explaining that. When we talk about targeting that right now, under most state formulas, when we talk about an extra $1,500 per kid, that money is sent to the school district, but we don't know if that kid is getting an additional $1,500 in services. I think that throws the public off because they hear about that. They hear, okay, there's additional money being put towards kids that need it, but then we don't know, is that money going to that kid or that, those groups of kids? Um, this would, this type of fifth generation system would say, if you're getting 1500 extra per kid, you're spending it on services for that kid. We're not going to tell you necessarily what those services are, but we've identified an English language learner student is needing additional help. We want, and we're providing as the state additional money for that help. We just want to make sure they're getting that. Um, it's a disconnect we have in our current formula. So there would be, a bit of a more requirement on districts and schools to track their spending, but how you do it would be up to you. Do you want to use that $1,500 for smaller class size? That's fine. You just need to report that. Do you need? Are you going to do it for additional other services outside of the school day or, or something like that? Then you just need to make sure you're tracking that and, and it's it's going to that kid. But you are suggesting uh, cool. that uh the fifth generation would fit into your concept of high quality funding formula and and you do kind of bring up a point which is you could theoretically have a fifth generation system that doesn't meet any of these just because you have a foundation formula which is a little newer than your formula doesn't mean it's any better the way they structure it doing these things in your formula does um that's more sort of the progression one is one is the goal the other is what we progress to at some point. I think people have tried to move to the fourth and fifth generation to try to answer these questions, but it doesn't always work. Um, you can have a foundation formula 
where you lock in a lot of your spending and you don't create flexibility for school districts. You could theoretically have an older system that has greater adaptability. It would be hard, but you, it's easier as you move through the generations to answer these and to address these, but it's not always necessarily true that that's going to happen. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a second question? Uh, hold on. Related to the first question, because we have another... No, related to the teacher salary schedule issue he mentioned. Let's hold on just for a second. Here, I'll come back to you. Senator Sanderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Griffith, um, just out for curiosity's sake, are these 33 states, when you were talking about the state and local split with mm -hmm. the 33 states, do any of those states give uh, local education uh, the ability to tax, or do they have... Uh, is is their money raised through property tax or sales tax or how do, how do, how does the local uh, entities raise that amount of money? So right now, there are probably about six or eight states that are dependent districts where the school district is dependent on either the city or the county that they're in. Um, there are a couple of states that have a mix of the two, but the rest of the states provide districts with the ability to tax. The vast majority of them provide the districts with the ability to levy a property tax. There are some cases where they allow them to levy a local sales tax, like in Tennessee, um, or a local income tax. But those are a little more rare. So what most states say is, here's the 50-50 here's the split or whatever the split is, you're going to have to go to your local property tax base and raise these dollars. Then it gets a little more complicated because in some states, you're allowed to tax that amount without going to the voters. In other places, you're allowed to tax part of that amount without going to the voters, but then you need to get the rest from a voter initiative. So in Ohio, for instance, to cover their share, school districts need to go back to the voters about every two years. Um, there are five states where the voters have to vote on the budget every year. Um, they vote on the whole budget, and within that budget, it talks about the tax increases, mainly New England states. But um, so different ones tackle that in different ways. My home state of Colorado has sort of a minimum levy that you have to do. Then there's a, a increase you can do by going to the voters, um, but you have to get an override of the tax cap to get there. So you're eventually you're voting on can we override the tax cap to, to tax a higher amount? So yeah, it's really split, and that's a, it's a very state by state thing once you start getting into that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will note in in North Carolina we have uh, most of our uh, counties do participate in some supplemental funding, but we have counties that simply do not have the tax base and do not have the ability to do that. And those those counties have kids in them that need a quality education. Representative Blackwell, back to you. Thank you. I want to talk just a little bit or ask a couple of questions or a question about the teacher schedule, pay schedule. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, North Carolina and Washington are the only ones that have this full schedule. Uh, Delaware is in there. And Delaware. Yeah. It's hard for me to see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we were to go away from that uh, to a system more like uh, the other states have, does that essentially mean that the local school district, perhaps subject to a minimum, uh, but uh, that the local school district would essentially determine how much each teacher got paid within their district? Yes. And follow up. That being said, can you talk to us a little bit about if, if, let's say for sake of argument, we wanted to do something akin to that. Have other states transitioned away from the full schedule and what are the different paths that might be taken to get from where we are to where we possibly could choose to be? So I think Tennessee is a good example. Tennessee has a fairly similar funding formula to you guys. They have a position allocation system. 
what they've been doing is slowly moving away from it over time. So it used to be they said, here's the number of teaching positions you're going to get. Here's what you're going to pay them. That's what you're going to kind of locked into as a school district. What they've moved to now is putting, they have three columns essentially. So they say, we're going to tell you how much we're going to make available for teaching positions and how many we would theoretically fund, but you can choose to spend that money differently if you want. And we're going to put that sort of in the classroom column. Then they have an administrative column, and they say this is how many superintendents or principals and all that you would get. But again, you can make decisions. You don't have to spend it that way. But you have to spend administrative costs on administrative stuff. You have to spend classroom on classroom. So you could not theoretically take a bunch of the money you got for teacher salaries and hire superintendents or assistant superintendents or whatnot. And then the third column is maintenance and operation type of stuff. And again, as long as you're spending in the columns, they're okay. It's a, a way to transition, and it might be something you guys want to look at. It provides greater freedom, but it's not the immediate move away from the type of system that you have today. Delaware has tried that, but the way Delaware has done it, it's made it even more confusing within their system. So they tell you the number of teaching positions you're going to get and what you can pay them, but you can buy out a teaching position, and that's where it gets really crazy because you only get 90% of the money if you buy it out. So they sit there and figure out, would we rather have one teacher that's funded at, say, $75,000, or would we want 90% of that in cash that we could spend somewhere else? So it's like cashing out a, a gift card kind of thing. You lose money on it. Um, so that's another way to do it. I would say the Tennessee way makes a lot more sense to me, that you've got some organization. You can still keep your teacher salary schedule, but there's some more freedom, not the full freedom of a base or foundation formula as opposed to the Delaware way, which is tinkering on the edges, which makes it even more confusing. One, one last follow-up, okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. But was any of that combined with any sort of um, anything akin to a hold harmless? For It's like, well, going forward you can do things, but we're not going to let you cut somebody's salary uh, beyond what they have been paying. you got to sort of start where you were. You can maybe do things differently with new teachers. I'd have to go back and look at it, but the Tennessee way, I know they intentionally kept the teacher salary schedule in place while they were making this transition. What has happened is districts have realized, just during this time since they've made the change to now, that they wanted to spend more on teachers to help retain them, to keep quality teachers. So they've diverted money that they had in other things into teacher salaries. So the salary structure has been there in Tennessee, uh, the statewide schedule. It just means less and less because districts are funneling more and more money over to teacher salaries and benefits. I think there's a belief by some, and I can understand it, that the way to control teacher salaries and make sure they're paid well is by moving to a statewide teacher salary schedule. But there's no correlation between a statewide teacher salary schedule and teacher pay, um, it, meaning that two states that spend essentially the same you would think the one that has a salary schedule over the one that doesn't pays their teachers more, but there's no correlation. The reason is districts make decisions, and they very often decide to move money from one column to the teacher column to retain those teachers. And I'll give the example of California. California spends below the national average per pupil, but they have the highest paid teachers in the country. They did that because the cost of living in California is so high. They can't attract and retain teachers unless they have a much higher salary schedule or salary than the rest. They didn't do this based on a salary schedule. They based this on needs. So they funneled an awful lot of their money. They have about 25 teachers or 25 students for every teacher in California. The national average is about 16 students for every teacher. So they just have much larger class sizes. They've made some decisions about how they can put more money into teacher salaries. My guess is the same things would happen here. The exception and the thing you always have to kind of worry about are the very poor districts that were mentioned by the chair. Those places can't often keep up with increases in salaries, and so they need some help to get there because what we see is the districts around them that might have some more money, some local money they can put in. They put it into teacher salaries to retain and attract teachers, and the low wealth places then start losing and hemorrhaging teachers to go to those places. So that's something that's, that, to me, would be a concern and something you might want to just put some safeguards in if you're going to move to greater freedom to help protect those types of districts. 
Representative Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're touching on my question, but, you know, in North Carolina, this is about the salary schedule. In North Carolina, it seems like over the last few years, by default, our salary schedule has begin, become the benchmark of adequate or inadequate funding for our public schools, and that's <clears throat> quoted a lot in the media. Um, if you move away from that, oh, the second part of that is a lot of our wealthier districts also have very nice supplements that they do supplement the salary, and then they begin to recruit cross-county lines for teachers because we have a teacher shortage and you got all those issues. So how do those states – you touched a little bit on how those states are dealing with it, but I'm trying to imagine how North Carolina would move away from full salary schedule and communicate to the public our adequacy of funding. It's, it sounds like you've got some experience in that area. So, yeah, and that's, again, we talked about it. Those two things go hand in hand, especially in your type of formula. That's going to be the largest item within your formula. It's going to be something people can pick out and, and figure out pretty quickly. Um, some states that don't have, so South, Carol or South Dakota, I worked there. They were trying to find a way to get more money to teachers because their teachers are one of the lowest paid in the, in the country. Yet their spending is about 35th. So there's something like 49th in teacher pay, 35th in expenditures. And what we found is there were districts that were hoarding money for various reasons and were spending it on things that weren't teacher salaries and benefits. <coughs> and what the state said is, we're going to put some extra money into the school system. We want this to go to teacher salaries and benefits, and you need to prove it to us. Um, and if you don't raise teacher salaries and benefits, if we don't see that happening throughout the state, we're going to come up with a statewide teacher salary schedule. We're going, we're going to use that as kind of the stick to get you moving. Um, I would say, though, in a system like yours, you're always going to have that, and I see this in Delaware and Washington State and a lesser extent in Tennessee, that have a system like yours. They'll look at it and they'll say, the funding controls the number of teachers and what they get paid. So if we look at that number, we can kind of determine if we're doing well or not. So it's, it's going to be always a difficulty with the current system you have. Even Tennessee gets that, even though their system has sort of moved away and they create greater flexibility. So did that answer your question? Okay. I would like to point out that in some of the states, California being one, uh, that uh, collective bargaining has a lot to do with how they approach salary schedules. Uh, how they negotiate those deals, whereas we do not have in North Carolina. We are a right-to-work state. Further questions in this section? Senator Curtis. So what gets shortchanged in California if they have low education funding and very high teacher salaries? Very large class sizes um, and some of the highest in the country. And they also went through um, – pretty difficult change over a 20-year period after they passed Proposition 13, which lowered property taxes. Um, they were near the higher end on spending per pupil. Then they slowly over time moved below the national average. They had to right-size in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of things that um, California public schools don't deliver. Almost all their sports and activities are uh, pay-to-play. And things like driver's ed that used to go through the school district, now parents have to pay for themselves. A lot of things like that. that they, they've kind of hollowed out all these different extra <coughs> services. I will say they passed a, when they made their change recently, about five years ago, they put an extra about $5 billion a year into education. And now as this sort of filters in, they're going to get up to around the national average in spending. Um, don't know if that's going to filter into teacher salaries or not. But, you know, it's even though they're uh, well above the national average, they're at 60-something thousand on average for teachers' salaries. Uh, it's still very difficult for them to find in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco area, in L.A., people who can afford to take on those salaries, even though they're higher than the national average. It's, it's cost of living issue. Seeing no more questions on this section, Mr. Griffin, do you need a break? Then we take maybe a five-minute recess. If I could get a glass of water, that would be really nice. Uh, why don't we take uh, – we'll come back in at five minutes of 11. Great. Thank you. <laughs>